people know you from from TV, from broadcasting mainly. So when did you first get that TV bug? Oh, uh, the first time I decided this is what I really wanted to do, I was actually quite young. I was 15 and I was on Blue Peter. And I'd gone on to do gymnastics because I was a gymnast. And I walked into the studios and I was like, oh my, it was a massive studio at TVC, the old iconic BBC studios, you know, in Shepherd's Bush that everybody knew and saw. And um, it just felt so exotic. And I was like, oh, this is amazing, all the lights, the cameras. And, and that's where I decided this is what I want to do. But of course, I, you know, I didn't know anybody who worked in telly. I'd never met anybody, you know, kind of in spite of having, you know, kind of my dad working in football, he met journalists, but we didn't really know telly people. So, um, yeah, it took me a while to find some contacts and try and get some work experience. But that was that was the light bulb moment. Mm. And what did people say when you sort of, you know, put that out of there as a career aspiration? Um, well, I my mum, whatever I said, she would say, go for it. You know, I could have come home and said I want to dissect frogs for, you know, for science for the rest of my life. She'd be like, brilliant. You know, I'd like to I'd like to be an actress. Great. You know, so she was very enthusiastic. Um, and But again, she didn't really know how to get there. So I wrote the um, the the director that day, there was a guy called Lewis Bronze who was directing the show and thanked him for having us on and said that I really was inspired and would like to work in telly. And he actually wrote back via the British Gymnastics Association a really lovely letter and said, go to university and get a degree. So it wasn't really very specific, It was, but it was nice of him to actually reply. And then years later, when I was working in telly, I was working for ITV and I was doing a show for ITV2 on health and fitness. and. It was his production company that was making it. He'd left the BBC. So as I walked on set, he said, ah, oh, you took my advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was it was a kind of um, in my immediate family. I think, you know, when you're a kid and you say you want to do something, most people just go, yeah, OK. You know, mm. I mean, my kids are 17 and they, my daughter's been through seven or eight different careers that she wants to do. So you never know what's going to stick, do you? Yeah. <laughs> and you open the book by talking about your brother, Daniel, who um, died when you were 19. Why is that where this had to start? It started practically from that point because when I knew I wanted to write, I, I've always been told, and I've tried to write quite a few different books and never got to the end of them, and I've always been told, just write. It's a, such a good practice. If you want to write, you just have to keep writing. And so that particular day I decided I couldn't really just work out where to start. So I just thought that's a day that I remember so vividly. I'll write about that day and thinking it would be somewhere in the book. And actually what I realised when I wrote about that day, and I call the chapter one day in May, was that it was seminal for my life really because there was a before and there was an after um, and everything changed after that. And everything that changed after that, I think, has probably contributed massively to who I am today. And um, what did his death change for what you wanted for your own life? I think his death gave me this um, urgency and so I felt like I had to get on and just do everything as quickly as possible because who knew what was around the corner? And for a few years, I had this feeling that, you know, a terrible thing could happen at any time because look what happened with Daniel. We did woke up that morning, he was fine. We went to bed at night and we'd lost him. So I, I had to kind of get going and do things. So I went off to university not long after and, you know, joined everything and wanted to be, you know, kind of active. And, and I suppose there's an element to that of living your life for two, but also, of running away a little bit from mm. your thoughts. And if you're busy enough, then you wouldn't have time to really process and think about things. Mm. When did you start to actually process it? Probably towards the end of my first year at university when I had my first lot of exams, I think I hit a bit of a wall. And I didn't do anything about it, but I was aware that I'd exhausted myself and I was mm. a, um, a kind of, tired and and yet I couldn't sleep and, th and all those feelings that actually and those uh, kind of emotions that would would say that I had a bit of not depression but I had certainly a bit of anxiety maybe and um, I went to see a doctor who didn't know me I was in my university town he wasn't a family doctor and he prescribed sleeping pills and I knew inherently that, that was not the way forwards you know that I didn't want to, at 19 years old 20 years old start to be reliant on sleeping pills and so I, I kind of got going again you know and picked myself up and got on with it and it wasn't really until I'd left university and I was now into my working life and I'd moved to London and started at Sky that I met a guy who introduced me to an acupuncturist ostensibly for my uh, skin because I used to get hormonal breakouts and actually she was a brilliant therapist and counsellor and that's when I really started to kind of unravel things, I think, and mm. give myself some kind of um, time to, to process. Yeah. 
And when you were sort of all guns blazing at university, you did do some amazing things for your career. Um, so what do those people mean to you who gave you that those kind of like first breaks into radio? Well, the first person was a guy called Giles Squire, who was the boss of the radio station I worked for the whole time I was at Durham. I worked in Newcastle. So I had these parallel lives going on where I was a student during the day um, or in the morning, and then I'd roll up and do a radio shift in the afternoon. And Giles had said to me, come and get some work experience. And by the Christmas of my first term, he was paying me for reading the news. So he was a, a perfect kind of example of somebody who was a mentor and, you know, somebody who put their money where their mouth is, didn't just say, call me and I'll give you some work experience. He actually kind of put me in the newsroom, told, you know, them to train me up and yeah. um, and I'm off I went. So, and I worked in the end there for four years, three of which I was a student doing my degree at the same time. So people like Giles, and I talk about another boss I had called Brian Barwick at ITV, and, um, and there've been others along the way. I think it's really important to, to mention them because in the context of the book, there is a chapter where I talk about the disappointing side of working in sports television in the early part of my career, where it was a very, there was a very misogynistic air at certain times. And, you know, it's, for me, it's important to balance that out as well, because it wasn't all like that. And it's, it's a kind of uh, a story of hope, I guess, that sometimes in those situations, there are people who, you know, you put your hand up and they'll, they'll pull you out. Um, and you mentioned in the book that you used a certain voice for your first late night radio show, which was Fiona Bruce with a hint of Yorkshire. May I hear it? I don't know, I don't know if I can tap back into it right now. Um, but um, um, I didn't know who Fiona Bruce was then. But when I look back now, I realise I was I was trying to be kind of sultry because it was late night. But I still had quite a Yorkshire accent, so it would be a bit like that, I guess. Um, and, and it wasn't difficult to be that that kind of sultriness because it was late night and I was the only person in the building. You know? <laughs> so it was about two in the morning and I'm introducing, you know, here's Sade, smooth operator. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> probably something like that. <laughs> and talking of kind of like first starts in things, um, you also wrote uh, your opening link to On the Ball, yeah. which you mention <laughs> in the book. Yeah. What was it? It was um, uh, What a Weekend with More Shocks Than an Electric Hairdryer Falling in a Bath. Uh, which is appalling, and uh, and and I think there's a lot of things I own up to in the book in the sense of like y you don't get things right at the beginning, yeah. right? You start a career, you're not perfect at the start. We have to make mistakes to get better. Not yeah. all as terrible as that link, but you know we do need to admit that to ourselves. And I think it's important that young people realise that as well. And you mentioned that you don't embarrass easily. So when does that come in handy in life? Live telly, probably. Um, I think I think the person who makes me realise that I still don't embarrass easily is Denise Lewis. I work with Denise Lewis quite a lot. And sometimes she kind of looks, her eyes go like this, because I think she thinks I'd be so embarrassed if that was me, um, especially when we're doing silly things on set. But um, it, I think um, when I was a kid, I I don't know, I think um, I, I wrote this, but they didn't include it in the book. I talk about um, how I used to be a fool in class, basically. And mm. um, I think it was, an, it, was, it was a paragraph that my editor was like, are you sure you want to include this? <laughs> um, and I was like, what's wrong with that? And she, she advised me against it. But um, I, I used to put Tipex on my tongue. Maybe it was that bit. And, um, and then when the teacher turned around, I'd show the rest of the class that my tongue was full of Tipex. And, um, and one of my friends, my very best friends, Anne-Marie, who I write about in the book, she, she was mortified for me she thought it was the most embarrassing thing because this was the age of about 13 where the girls really wanted to impress the boys <laughs> not look like a clown and so I was just more into looking like the clown and making them laugh and then um, and then I used to do this thing where I tied myself to my chair with a tie and then I'd move around the classroom so that when the teacher turned around I'd move to a different place and again they were laughing but the teacher would get very cross with me mm -hmm. and send me out of the classroom but it was worth it to get the laugh obviously from my classmates and so I look back at that and think well, I clearly wasn't that embarrassed mm -hmm. by it because I was just you know doing it for kicks. Does it help when Colin Jackson teases you about the way that you first met? Yes um, and and he does it with that lovely glinty smile so Colin is a colleague from BBC Sport now, but back in the day, of course, was a world champion high hurdler and was, I thought, a dreamboat. You know, I'd watched him on telly, thought he was this incredibly fit, gorgeous athlete. And there I found myself wearing the same tracksuit as him. At, well, not literally, but in the Commonwealth Games, we're both representing Wales. And the first morning I went into the dining room and there were very few athletes in there. And there was a group of Wales athletes. And my coach said, let's just go join the Wales athletes. And I sat down, I was next to Colin Jackson, which was like, I just must have been blushing like an absolute beacon. And I couldn't speak because it was Colin Jackson. 
and uh, yeah, it was it was like a proper. I'm surprised I didn't have love hearts falling from my eyes. <laughs> and yeah, um, he did he did remind me of that a few times. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm so lucky that I get to call people like him my colleague now. And like, yeah. if you told me that 16 year old sitting there, oh, one day you'll have him next to you on set, and you know you'll be the presenter asking him questions. I would have just been like what, how, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone can listen and read the first half and. We look forward in the years to come to the second half. Oh, thank you so, so much. It's been really lovely to chat to you. Thanks.